Well, good evening, everyone. My name's Will. I'm one of the pastors here at Castle Hill Baptist Church, and it's good to be able to share God's Word with you tonight. Uh, just an announcement before we get into it. Next week, we'll be having a Q&A. That's another opportunity for you to ask some of your questions, and then the pastors will be answering them. So if you can send in your questions this week to one of the pastors or to the office by Thursday, because that's when we're going to be recording. Tonight we're going to be looking at a passage in Ephesians 5, and I'm going to read that passage during the sermon, so before we get into it, let's pray. Our great God, we thank you for this time that we can continue to gather under your word, and that we can continue to gather and learn from you. And we thank you, God, that soon we will be gathering together and being out of fellowship and grow together under your word. We thank you that you have made this possible And we pray, God, that we would make the most of this time when we can gather again and that we would use it well. We pray now for our time under your word that you would grow us. We pray that you would give us open ears, that you would give us a deep desire to want to honor you with our lives and a desire to learn from your word and to see how we can do this. And we pray, God, as well, that from all these things that we learn, we wouldn't just let them brush through our head, but we really pray, God, that we would seek to apply them and live them. May they not just be lessons that we learn again, but may there be things that are transforming us and changing us for your glory. And so we pray, God, that all we learn tonight would be uh, something that is needed, that we need to hear, and something that trans- transforms us. And I pray, God, for myself that you would uh, be growing me as well through these things, be teaching me stuff. And I pray that you would uh, be speaking through me and that your Holy Spirit would be giving me the words to speak. And I pray this for your glory. Amen. Well, tonight, our passage speaks of one of the most precious and valuable commodities that every person has, whether rich or poor, young or old, wise or foolish. It's a gift we have been given by God that we need to use well. But it is often so misunderstood and wasted. It's something we love and feel there is never enough of. But it's also something we at times hate because it is a hard taskmaster and puts great pressure on us. And it's something that brings huge regret and guilt in how we use it. And we can never get it back once we have used it. What am I talking about? Well, it's time. Our lives and the time God has given us is so precious. But does God care about how we use and manage our time. I want us to think about that. Is productivity something God wants us to seek and pursue? Well, I think we can certainly say yes to that. God does. God cares about our time and productivity. And our passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 17, shows it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 17. God says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. God cares about our time and how we live and our productivity. Verse 15 begins saying, Be very careful then how you live. God commands here for us to be very careful, to take care, pay close attention, and ensure you live as someone who is wise. And the command, be very careful, carries on into verse 16, where it says, make the most of every opportunity, which literally should say, make the best use of time, as some of the translations say. Verse 15 to 16 here are one unit, one flow of thought. And God's commanding us to be very careful with how we live and to make the best use of time. God is commanding us to be careful in these ways. Your life, your time, the opportunities you have, how you use them matters to God. Time is an important and precious gift. Really, we shouldn't have any time. We should have none. We should have no life. We should be given what we deserve, which really should be hell. But God is gracious and he gives us time. He gives us breath and life. And so God desires for us to use well this gift 
that he has given us. Right from the beginning of the Bible, we see that God told Adam and Eve to subdue the earth. God desired for them to use what the earth provides well for their own benefit, to be productive with creation for God's glory. And then this ramps up for the Christian because for the Christian, Jesus has died to purchase us. Our lives and time are completely his. We've been saved to now be used for God's purposes. Titus 2 shows we are redeemed to be a people zealous for good works, Titus 2.14. And we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, says Ephesians 2 verse 10. So God has purchased us for a purpose and it's to use our lives for a certain purpose. And this is why God is saying here in this passage, be very careful how you live. Make the best use of time and every opportunity. God wants us to take care with how we live and how we use our lives and how we use our time. In the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, God shows that being productive and using well the things God has given us is something that he deeply cares about. And like the third person in the parable, those who are not fruitful with what God has given them will be called faithless and face judgment for it. We are to pay close attention to our lives and ensure that our time is used well because we will be held to account for it. So do you do this? Can you say that you are very careful with how you live, with how you use your time? Do you think about how you use it? We need to. And we need to learn how to use it well and how to be productive and how to make the most of the time that God has given us. And so that's what we're going to aim to do tonight through this passage. But why does it matter? I want to answer this question first. Why does it matter? Why should we think about how we use our time? Well, we've already seen the first answer. It's because, because God tells us and commands us to be careful how we live and to make the best use of time. God commands us to be careful. But the passage gives us a second reason, which I want to jump to and, and see before we slowly work through the passage. And the second reason for why we should think about how we use our time is given in verse 16. It says, Make the most of every opportunity or make the best use of time because the days are evil. A key reason in this passage for why we are to be productive and use time well is because the days are evil. Now, what does that mean? Well, the context of this passage actually gives us a hint. And verse 15 shows that this section is closely linked to the rest of the passage. Verse 15 began by saying, Be very careful then how you live. The conjunction then, or it could be translated therefore, is used here and it's telling us that the things Paul has already said show us why we need to be careful with our lives and how we use our time, which is the question we're now answering. So what has Paul already said then? Well, Paul's been showing the prevalence and dangers of darkness, which is a symbol of evil. He's been urging the church to have nothing to do with the disobedient, but to expose them with the light, which is the truth of Christ. And in light of this, verse 15 begins and it says, Therefore, be careful how you live. The point is, evil is prevalent around us. It is constantly around us. And so expose it with the light or with the truth. Or in the language of verse 17 in our passage, understand the Lord's will because verse 15 just said, the days are evil. We need to realize that there's a great temptation and pressure around us to use our time and lives in a wrong way. So much around us is trying to grip us so that we misuse our time. Satan is working in so many things to make us waste opportunities. And so, 
We need to be careful with our life, with our time. We need to live wise. And we need to understand the Lord's will. Also, implied here by this phrase, the days are evil, is the fact that judgment is coming upon evil and the end is near. How do I know this? Well, I think the parallel passage to ours in Colossians makes it clear. If you want, you can turn there. It's in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 to 6. It says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In this passage here in Colossians, Paul repeats the phrase from Ephesians 5, make the most of every opportunity. And here in Colossians, Paul ties this phrase to proclaiming the gospel in word and deed. So Paul uses the phrase here, make the most of every opportunity in relation to evangelism in Colossians. So it seems likely when he says it in Ephesians, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil, he's particularly saying, make the best use of your time to spread God's word, the gospel and God's kingdom. Expose the darkness with light because the time is short. People will be judged. Hell is real and just around the corner for so many. Spread God's kingdom for his glory. Because people's souls are at stake. And so clearly here we're seeing how time matters and how we use it matters. We have seen here in that phrase, because the days are evil, why we need to use our time well. And so we need to now ask and answer the question, how can we be careful in how we live and use our time? The first answer our passage gives is that we need to be wise with our life and time. Verse 15 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. God calls us to be careful to be wise. God wants us to make the effort to be wise in how we live and use our time. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 to 8 shows how we need to need to pursue this wisdom to be wise with our time. It says in Proverbs 6, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Psalm 90 also links wisdom with our lives and time. It says the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away. So teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Time is short. We have felt it this week even with the funerals. And so we need to. Because time is short, we need to gain a heart of wisdom. We need to number our days and not waste them. We need to think on how we should use them. Also, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it shows that everything has a time and a season. And it takes wisdom to learn this. We must learn to read the seasons of life and do them well and see how God is served in everything and at certain points, and know the right season. We need to not try to do everything at once, because you can't. We need to not always rush to the next thing, or something that we think will be better, or not always be looking to what is ahead. We can actually miss out on so many good opportunities, because we are always living for the next one, or something in the future, or trying to cram everything in into that one moment. We need to instead enjoy the moments that God has given us. Make the most of those moments. Thank God for them and live for his glory in them. We need to not become slaves to time. We often think that we we need to be busy. And people think that they need to show themselves to be busy. 
But God doesn't want us running around crazy efficient at doing heaps of stuff. He wants you to be effective and doing the right stuff. And so we need wisdom to know this and to know what is right. We also need wisdom because it is so easy to waste our time on things we don't need to do. And this brings us to our second point. We need to be profitable in how we use our time. Verse 16 to 17 says, Make the most of every opportunity or our time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Here the passage is really answering the question in verse 17, particularly at the end, of what should we use our time for? The passage is answering answering that question. What should we use our time for? In verse 17, the word understand in that verse is actually a command. It's a command to understand and think about what the will of the Lord is. Verse 10 has already said it like this. It said, find out what pleases the Lord. We can know what God wants and how he wants us to use our time. And we are to live as God wants, which is revealed in his word. God here is commanding us to think about it, to figure it out, to think about it and look at his word. And we could spend so much time here going through the Bible and seeing what God wants of us. And I encourage you to do that, to look through God's word, maybe make a list of of the life goals and longings you should have that are in line with God's word. But for us now, let's just quickly do what this passage is commanding us and understand the Lord's will for us in a brief way. Let's briefly see some things that God wants for us with our time. And verses 18 to 21 quickly show us a few. The verses just after our passage in Ephesians 5, it shows there that we are to be filled with the Spirit. God wants us to be filled with the Spirit, which really comes through prayer and being med- and meditating in God's Word. He also wants us to encourage others. He wants us to worship and thank Him. He wants us to submit to others. But even more so in the context of our passage, a bigger one has come at the beginning of chapter 5. And it's shown a key aspect of what the Lord's will is for us. Chapter 5, verse 2 said, Live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Life will not be productive if we're not aiming to do the two great commands that God gives us. Life will not be productive if we are not aiming to love God and love others. This is God's will. 1 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Let all you do be done in love. Love. Love others. Put others first to be fruitful and productive in all you do. But also, to do God's will, we see therefore that we need to grow in our love for God. We need to grow in our love for God and enjoy Him. God has revealed himself. He has sent his son so that we can know him and draw near to him. And in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. And so to have him and more of him should be our pursuit. It should be our desire. As we grow to love him, we should want more of him. And this is God's will for us. He wants us to know him. He wants us to seek after him and draw near to him and enjoy him. But also the second aspect there of love We are to love God, but we also are to love others. And I want to focus on one part, one way we are to love others, is by doing good so that God gains glory. We are to do good as Christians so that God gains glory. And this is a huge way that we can understand and live God's will. Matthew 5 verse 16 says, Jesus says here, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In doing good, God gains glory. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good. 
And Titus chapter 2 says, God redeemed us to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Clearly, the Christian has been saved to do good works. And the gospel is to motivate good works in us. God has accepted and saved us, though we are not good, and could not fulfill what God required of us. But as Titus 3 verse 4 to 8 shows, realizing how God has saved us should cause those who have trusted in God to be careful. Titus 3 says, to be careful. Verse 8, Titus 3 verse 8, to be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable. And then verse 14 in Titus 3 says, Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. To be profitable and productive, we need to do good. And the gospel should motivate this in us. For the Christian, at the heart of being productive is doing good. And the gospel should free us to do good in life in radical ways ways. The gospel should bring in us a deep love for God that makes us long to love others and do good to others so that we please God. But also, we need to realize that we do good not just in the radical ways, but we do good too in the mundane, everyday parts of our life. Doing good is not just some high and lofty spiritual thing that we think of. It is everything done for the benefit of others, through faith in God, for the glory of God. Work, doing the dishes, raising up kids, cooking dinner, our holidays, that phone call to a friend can be good works. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 15 says, Always, always seek to do good to one another and to every one. John Wesley, I love how he puts it. He says, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. And Spurgeon says, let us be on the watch for opportunities of usefulness. Let us go about the world with our ears and eyes open, ready to avail ourselves to every occasion for doing good. Let us not be content till we are useful. But make this the main design and ambition of our lives. So we're seeing here, what are we to do with our time? What are we to do with our lives? Well, we're to understand the Lord's will. And the one we've been particularly focusing on is that the Lord's will is to do good. Because in it, God gains glory. And do good by spreading as well the gospel to save and mature people in Christ. Seek first God's kingdom and for his kingdom to go out. Don't aim to just do things in life, but aim to do good and serve for the benefit of others through your faith in God for the glory of God. And so we're seeing here that this passage here in Ephesians 5, 15 to 17, it's showing us and telling us to not be foolish to be careful how you live, to understand what the Lord's will is so that you live how God wants and so that you use your time in a way that he wants. But finally, how else can we be careful in how we live? How else can we be careful in how we live and use our time? Well, the third thing we see in the passage is that we need to be effective with our time. This really comes out in verse 16. The challenge comes there when it says in verse 15 to be careful how you live and then carries on the flow of thought to say, make the best use of time. God wants us to do this. He wants us to actually be careful in how we live and and make sure we make the best use of time. But how can we actually do that? Well, we've seen we need to do the Lord's will. We need to do what he wants with our time. But let's now move away from the what the question of what, and to the how. How can we use time well? How can we actually do it? Well, as we close here, 
Here I just want to give some suggestions for how we can be careful to use our time well. How we can be careful to live in a way that God wants and make the best use of time. So here are some suggestions. Firstly, know what you're living for and your purpose. We as Christians have one. We have a purpose to glorify God as we know Him and enjoy Him and live for Him alongside others. Don't just do lots, but know what should be done in life. We need to not just do lots of things, but need, we need to know what should be focused on, what is most important, and we need to do that. So many think it's, it's great because they're busy and they're doing lots, but it could all be useless stuff in light of eternity. So know what you're living for and your purpose. Secondly, we need to know our life longings and our resolutions in light of God's word. I remember as a teenager doing this and putting in a little envelope different longings that I had in life in light of God's word. And we need to do this. I need to keep doing this. We need to spend some time thinking about our life and our time and what we're aiming at doing in it. And then we need to ensure that we are actually doing those aims in all that we are doing. Jonathan Edwards, he, in his life, at the age of 19, made 70 biblically driven resolutions and he aimed to live by them. We should be doing this too. Thirdly, we should also look at the roles that we have in life and think each day, what do I need to do in this role to do good for the glory of God? Think about that in the different roles you have as a husband or a wife, a son or a daughter, as a neighbor, an employee, Bible study member. What do you need to do in that role to do good for the glory of Christ? Next, remember that you are a child of God. This is so important as we're seeking to use our time well. We need to remember first that we as well are a child of God, not because of how we do things, We're not a child of God because of how we do things, but because of how and what Christ has done. But also in this, remember that the gospel should change how you do everything, every day, as we've already mentioned. Fifth, what's another key thing to help us make the most of time and use our time well? Well, we need to grow in godly character, not in time management strategies. Godly character or or wisdom, as our passage said, will help us make the right decisions and do the right things in our time. And it will also make for the effective life in us because holiness is what God wants. Godly character is what God wants in us. Next, how can we be careful to make the best use of time? We'll do the most important things. Do what matters most. Block out the essentials in the week or they won't happen. Make time to spend in God's word and prayer. Take time to retreat with God. Make time for your family devotions or to witness to that friend who's not a Christian or to spend a night growing your marriage. And you need to stick to these things. See it as a block of time where you are busy. Otherwise, these things won't happen if they just get replaced. Also, we need to next focus on one thing at a time. Sometimes we think we can multitask and we try to, but we actually can't. When we try to do multiple things at once that our, our brain is uh, required in, we're actually just switching between these tasks. I know it for myself. And time is lost as we go in and out switching between each of those tasks. And it actually wastes a lot of time. And so instead, we need to block out time. For big tasks, particularly big projects, you can't just get them done in 10 minutes here and there randomly throughout the day. You need to focus for a few hours to do that. Next, another key way to help us make the most of time is actually allocating some set times to clear the list, clear the messages, clear the notifications and emails and do all those small little things that can so often be a distraction. At times we try to do that all throughout the day and they just keep distracting us from the bigger projects and tasks we're trying to do. But what might be better is setting a a time at the start of the day to do those things and tick them off. And if you need to, do that again near lunchtime or maybe in the afternoon at the end of the day. And then once you've done them, put them aside and focus on the big, big things for the next few hours. Also, a way to help us make the best use of time, we can create allocated time 
in our week to do certain tasks. And, and in this nearly impose deadlines upon us. Sometimes we might have something we need to do, but it doesn't need to be do for, done for a certain amount of time. And if we don't have a goal and a time to do it by, it's really hard to do. It's hard to get the motivation to do it. So setting those deadlines can help us. Also, we need to remove from our schedule the many things that aren't important. So often we cram our lives with things that really aren't important in light of eternity. And so we need to remove them. We also need to remove the distractions and the things that cause us to just keep procrastinating, whatever they are. Next, we also need to live in the moment. This is a big one that I've been learning recently. We need to live in the moment rather than just trying to rush through everything. Don't always look ahead at the future. Be present in the now. Make the most of it. Enjoy it. Thank God for it. We will miss great blessings in life if we are too busy and always rushing. Lately, God has really taught me this, to enjoy and make the most of my family time and each moment in life that God's, God gives me. Make the most of it to the glory of Christ. A few more. To make the most of our time, we need to plan ahead. We need to plan ahead to actually save time. Scheduling out that week can help so much rather than just doing things along the way. Having a simple schedule and planning it out can really help. Another one is actually leaving some buffer times in that schedule. For me, I find this helpful. Leaving some buffer times where you don't completely fill your day to the brim and schedule everything out. Instead, you leave a couple of hours up your sleeve. Everything in life often needs this. Things like our roads, they don't function to the best and most efficient uh, way that they can when they're at full capacity. We know that because of traffic. And our schedules can be the same. They won't be as efficient if they are filled to the brim. Too often in our lives, we're bouncing from one thing to the next with no time in between to pray, to process what's happened, or to do those things well. So instead, we need to leave a bit of a buffer a bit of a buffer time. And if we have a bit of spare time in the end, use it to pray or meditate on God's word or let God, maybe he'll bring someone into your life to have an opportunity to share with. And finally, a key thing that we really need to do to make sure we make the best use of time, a key thing that we need to do to be careful in how we live is to seek for the Lord to build our life. We saw this wonderfully, wonderfully back last week in Psalm 127, where it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. It's useless and unproductive if God is not in what you are doing. If he's not in all that you do, it's useless, unproductive. It's in vain. And, and prayer and seeking God's wisdom through his word is the only way that you can ensure that God is building your life. And so we need to seek for God to be working in all that we do. Well, I could say so much more. There are so many things out there, ways that can really help us use our time well for the glory of God. But if this is something you want to think more about, and something you want to work through, I really encourage you to read the book, What's Best Next? How the Gospel Transforms the Way You Get Things Done. It's by Matt Perman. It's a great book that I've enjoyed, and I encourage you to have a read. It's called What's Best Next? How the Gospel Transforms the Way You Get Things Done. Well, as we close, we, we know that we only have one life. It's soon going to be gone like a mist. This life is short and yet it impacts eternity. And so the Christian should not just cruise through life, but they should take great care as we've seen in the passage. They should put thought to how they live. They should make the best use of time. And so may we as a church use every moment well for God's glory and may we be careful with how we live. And may we make the best use of this precious time that God has given us. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for the wisdom of your word. We thank you for the challenges that it has given us here. And we pray, God, that this wouldn't just be another time where we go away learning things without doing them. Please, God, help us to use our time well for your glory and for your purposes. And we pray, God, that you would show us what it is we need to do in life to make the most of our time, to make the most of every opportunity that you give us and to use this precious resource that we have for you. Please show us how to do this, God, and please help us to live lives that would honor and glorify you. Amen. Thank you.